Okay, I think we can start. Thank you for coming. You are a lot of people, which is nice. Uh, I hope you'll find this talk uh, useful, and if not, at least entertaining. I'll do my best. Uh, my name is Baruch. I am a developer advocate with uh, JFrog, JBaruch at Twitter and generally over the internet. And the developer advocate, uh, everybody knows by now, but still, um, it's the guy that hangs out with the technical guys, developers, DevOps, and then come to conferences like this one to tell you about the cool things they do. It's a hard job. <laughs> you experienced it yesterday by yourself, right? Uh, JFrog is a startup, um, not so small now apparently. We started in Israel and all the development is still in Israel. We have headquarters in Santa Clara and a new tiny office in France. We have things with frogs, as you can see here. We have cool frogs t-shirts in our booth. If you didn't stop by, please, uh, please do. Um, we have three products, JFrog Artifactory, JFrog Bintray, and JFrog Mission Control. Uh, but today we are going to talk about Docker and not about the products that they hear. Uh, so let's talk about Docker. Um, let's do some polling to understand where we stand. Who heard about Docker? All right, and you can leave, you can leave your hands up. Who did the tutorial successfully? All right. POC playing with it, etc., etc. Okay. Now I have about third of the keep keep them up. About third of the room with their hands up. And now look at the magic. Look at each other. How many of you took it to production? Boom. No hands. Okay. Couple of right. Couple of hands. But you got the idea, right? And this is something like I I did it because I knew exactly what is going to happen. We see it every time. People know about Docker, people play with Docker. Almost no one takes it to production. And the interesting question is why? And we try to analyze it and the industry in general um, tries to answer this question, why people want to take Docker to production. It was a good, um, a good reason not to take it to production before it was released before 1.0, and then it was a good reason not to take it to production because it was 1.0, but now it's been a while when it should be stable, and still very few of us actually use Docker in production. And what we learned in JFrog, and generally this is what we hear, and this is what we know, is that people love, really love Docker, but they can't trust Docker when it comes to taking it to production. And there are a lot of reasons why people don't trust Docker. First of all, it's a very opaque level of, um, level of abstraction, right? We have those containers in which there is really no easy way to know what's going on. And, <clears throat> and that's a big deal. While we wrap something with this thick level of in direction or, or, or container actually, it causes some kind of trust issue. I'm not sure what's going on inside. So what we actually look for and what we cannot really find easily with Docker is the what we call continuous integrity. Continuous integrity is the building this level of trust between you and your tool that you will be able to take it to production and actually make, be confident 100% that what's run into this container in production is exactly what you expected there to be. And before <clears throat> I will tell you um, f what from our perspective it takes to build this continuous integrity, let me tell you real quick why I think I can talk about Docker standing here in front of you. Well, I cannot comment on why, what this frog exactly does to the well, uh, but uh, the, uh, the idea is that JFrog Artifactory and Bintray, by the way, 
uh, have very tight integration with Docker. And uh, that's because Docker files are binaries and that's exactly what we do for more than a decade now. So we actually had, we have a decade of experience with managing binaries and we did the image registry before there was Docker registry. We did a private image hosting before there was Docker Hub and we do promotion pipelines for Docker. And that's exactly what this talk is about, why you actually need it and what is it in general and why it will help you to build this trust between you and Docker that you like but not sure you trust. So um, this is a screenshot from DockerCon uh, last year um, in San Francisco. Solomon Hikes, of course, the creator of Docker, asks audience a very simple question. Who uses Docker and nothing else? So let's do this here. Who uses Docker and nothing but Docker organizationally? you might reconsider this hand. And I'll explain what I mean. Maybe the question is not, is not put well enough. Docker is a container technology, right? And thinking about containers in the real world, no one actually ships empty containers back and forth just because they can do it. There is always something that needs to be put inside those containers, right? It can be your Java application, it can be your Python application, Ruby application, whatever you build, you wrap it in the container and then you actually ship it, deploy it, etc., etc. right? So no one uses Docker for the sake of Docker itself. And that's something that all, all, you also need to remember when you select your tool for Docker registry. But that's enough about, um, <clears throat> about uh, why uh, we speak about Docker. Let's talk about the promotion pyramid. This is in no way a new concept. This is something that we do for years. What you see here is number of builds that go into these promotion pyramids, and then those builds pass tests. Tests become slower as they go up, here you can think about unit tests and here there are integration tests, dev integration tests, integration tests, te uh, staging, pre-production and production. And less and less builds survive those tests and go to the next level. So although tests become longer, there are few tests to build and that means that the trade-off be be between the uh, time that the test takes and the amount of builds is remains constant during this promotion pyramid. And then eventually you have one or maybe a couple of builds that survived all the tests and that means that they should go to production. Another view of the same picture is the promotion pipeline. So what you see here is those are quality gates and builds as they go through those quality gates promoted from one repository to another. We all start here in our development and then the um, artifacts that passed the unit tests go to a, next, um, <coughs> to a next level. They pass some tests here, go to the next level, pass some tests here, go to the next level, etc., etc. So those are quality gates. And again, this idea is no new in any way. I think that the book that I took this image from, Agile ILM, is now already about seven or eight years old. It's not a new, it's not a new concept. And we actually do them for years. And before we will dive into trying to do it with Docker, let's understand how we do it with development. And with development, again, you all should be familiar with, with what I'm going to show you now. It's in no way a new concept. So you have your development team, they write code. And when they write code, they use their dependencies and manager tools to add new dependencies. It can be, of course, a Maven POM file, Gradle scripts for Java. It can be Nougat dependencies for .NET. It can be Ruby gems, um, <coughs> Python eggs, uh, NPM packages, whatever. They add new dependencies and then the developer runs the build into their own environment. 
and this build will try to fetch the dependencies. It will find them in your in-house repository or not. If they are not found in your in-house repository, they will be fetched from remote repositories, being JCenter or Maven Central or NPM registry or, or whatever. After this was successfully done, the artifacts, the, the artifacts are thrown away. I don't need the artifacts that I build on my machine. And the developer will commit the code to the version control system. And here is exactly where the uh, CI server kicks in. CI server monitors the version control, discovers there are new builds, and then so new commits, and then start the build. And the build will be exactly the same, right? It will be the, the same uh, build that we run here in step number one, and they will need dependencies. Those dependencies will again come from your in-house repository. This time they will be there for sure because you already did it, you already prefetched them earlier. So the build is successful, and then the artifacts are deployed to your repository with additional metadata about how the build went, which dependencies were used, which environments variables were there, etc. etc. And now this is those tools are the part of the same pipeline that I showed you in the previous slide. So you have a Selenium for UI, Gatling for stress test, manual QA, QA if you use it, etc., etc. All those contribute to the metadata of the build. So the Selenium might say, okay, this build works for a Firefox and for Chrome, but doesn't work for Internet Explorer, which is actually the default value anyhow. Um, so after the metadata is submitted, next step will be deploying to production. And here we will use tools like Chef, Puppet, or whatever to take what we just built and put them on our production servers, right? And if we have something that needs to be distributed, then you put it on your distribution um, infrastructure, being a Jeffrey Bintray or any other download server. It can be your shared folder on your file system or, or whatever will it be. So that's the whole story. And again, I really, I, I'm sure 100% that 100% of you know this picture. This is not new. So the only question is how we take that and make it work for Docker. There is something in Docker that actively fights our efforts to build promotion pipelines with Docker. And this is this guy, not Chuck Norris. If Chuck Norris would fight, we didn't stand a chance. It's the Docker build. Docker build, it's of course Docker command that creates new image, right? You all uh, know that if you did the tutorial. Docker build creates the image. The problem with Docker build is that it's very easy. And that's the problem because once we have such a powerful tool as Docker build, and it's that easy to operate, we have a natural drive to docker build all the things. We really can, and this is what most of the people do, build this docker image each and every time. We can use the docker build file, that's the recipe for building the container, to promote instead of promoting the images. We can take the docker file and build it here, and then we can decide that what we see is good, the image it created, and then we can promote it to the next environment and build it here again, check the image again, throw it away, promote the Docker build, build it again here, check it, etc., etc. So we see it a lot because Docker build, promoting a, a text file is much easier than promoting a binary, right? This is, this is a natural thing. It's very fast. It's very easy. The problem is fast and cheap builds are not always the way to go. This is Shanghai, China. True story. So the problem with Docker build is that. This is, I, so when I prepared this talk, I said, okay, I need to fake a horrible, horrible build file to show you how bad it can be. And then I actually discovered this in one of the canonical repositories of, I think what it is? It's, it's Node, right? This is like the example in the Node repository of how to create Docker image with Node. And this is horrible in every line of it. So I didn't need to fake one. 
This is a true story. Every line of this Docker file relies on a dependency in its latest version, which means that they will change over time. Every time new Ubuntu is released, every time new Python is released, every time new Node.js is released, I will get a different image. And of course, when I have six lines of those dependencies, the probability of having the same image when I run Docker build twice is, of course, reduced dramatically, right? So that's the problem. Well, can we fix it? We can try. So let's try to fix it. First of all, it's very easy to name the version, right? We can say, okay, I don't want latest Ubuntu. I want Ubuntu 14.04. Is it better now? Who thinks it's better now? It's much better now. Well, no, it's actually the, exactly the same. Ubuntu distributors want us to have the latest security updates, which is a very good cause. And they know that people want to upgrade very easily because we are talking about operating system. So what they do, they constantly push security upgrades into the same version. What we have now, and we are now almost two years after April 14, what we have now under Ubuntu 14.04 has is very, very far away from what was released on April 14, actually, right? It's a completely different image that changed many times since then. Well, we can do something else. We can use what called in a Docker a, a, a fingerprint. Fingerprint is actually a SHA-2, SHA-256, which is a checksum that identifies the image. Now, this is very reliable. If I use the fingerprint, I can be 100% sure that this is the image that will be downloaded every time. Is it useful? Not so much. Um, so I have a question for you. Which version is that? You can assume that it's 1404 because of the previous slide, but I might trick you and use something else here, right? You have no idea. More so, there is another problem. This is not the only latest dependency. How about all those? Usually, we can nail down dependencies version in most of the dependency managers, right? So here in apt-get, again, I can name the version here and it will be reliable or not, depending on the concrete uh, implementation of the dependency manager. But the thing is, we can write here whatever we like. We can run Maven here easily, right? Run command and then MVN install. And then we will rely on whatever is written in some POM file that we never saw. It might be version ranges, it might be latest, it might be we have no idea what. And how about npm install? Now, npm is horrible in managing dependencies because in their descriptor file, not only you can use latest, but you can just put a URL of the file out of nowhere. It can come from the internet, a file which we have no idea about, right? So what's going on here? We have no idea and we usually don't have any control. So what it means is that we cannot rely on Docker build and hope that we will get the same image every time we build. And this is exactly what brings this feeling of untrust when we are talking about building pipelines. Yeah, before it falls, right? <clears throat> All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. What's the right way to do it? The right way to do it, of course, is building once. As we do for Java, as we do 
for .NET as we do for the development. We need to build once and then take what we build, take the image and promote it like that. We build only once and then we promote it with the binaries. That's the same image I had a couple of slides ago. That's what we do for, for, for years. So what's the problem? Why we don't do that? We don't do that because Docker as a tool made everything possible to make it as harder as possible for us to do it. <coughs> so there are limitations in the tool that fight with us when we try to do the right thing. One of them is the tag command. This is the tag command. And it allows you to specify where the image should come from or when you want to deploy your image. We are talking about promotion pipelines. We are talking about deploying this image, the same image, to different repositories as we promote it through different quality gates. We put it in the development repository and then we move it to the staging, pre-production, production, etc. But look at the type, co type, command, type command. In the type command, we don't have the ability to provide any repository. The only thing that we can provide is the host name. So we can say, okay, it's my registry, my repository that installed on my machine in my organization, but there is no way to say whether it's a development environment, staging environment, pre-production or production or whatever. What is written here is that there can be only one registry per host. So how can we have more than one repository? We can't. At least not in an easy way, right? And this is one of those trumped up limitations that fight with us when we are trying to do the right thing. That's what we usually do. That's the right solution. And if not, we have something that been there for ages, but now have a new life thanks to this limitation of Docker, and that's the virtual repository. Virtual repository in Artifactory is a repository that hides local and any number of local, remote, and other virtual repositories under a single URL. And here we have a very interesting solution because if we have a single URL, that means that for Docker perspective, it looks like we have a single repository. And that's actually kind of start to solve the problem. So we minimized the number of Docker repositories of the repositories that Docker interact with, right? It can be one or two, or we will talk about it in a second. And then we deploy, we push to this virtual repository after we build our image. It goes to the first repository in this promotion pipeline, and then we start promoting within Artifactory between repositories. And then when we want to roll it out to a particular environment, we will use again virtual repository which will be production ready or any other environment ready, okay? So what we have here is we have a developer that resolves the base image from Docker Hub. It will go through the same URL, resolves all the dependencies that they need from Docker Dev and Docker Prod, from all the repositories they need. And once this image is ready, it will be deployed or pushed to this virtual again that will be deployed to a dev local. Now we can have many more of those and then we have REST API or CI server or whatever that will promote inside Artifactory through those repositories. Now if we want to try it out and deploy it to a server, we can use those as the tags for those repositories to download and deploy. And then when we have a user that need it in production, it will be resolved from the production repository only, but all that happens only through this virtual repository, which in fact almost solves the problem that we have, right? We can decide whether we want the end user to see Docker Hub or not. Usually we don't, 
we only will rely on whatever we build, but anyhow, this is a solution for this problem. Well, almost. We still have a problem of the URL. Even if you use a virtual repository, it still will be under some context name, factory or any other, and then we do have a repo name. It will be a single repository, but still it's something not allowed by the tag syntax. Tag syntax only gets a host name. So how can we convert something like that? We have a host, a port, and then a context name, a virtual repository name, and then some tag to just host, port, and the tag. Right, how can we do that? And of course, the answer is we can use stuff like URL rewriting in um, HTTP proxies like uh, Nginx or, or Apache. Now, interesting story about that. Um, there is a new version of Docker uh, Trusted Registry that is out, I think, a couple of weeks ago, and it actually comes with two registries inside. And the way that Docker now, Docker is the company, the ones who invented this tag format is suggesting you to use two repositories inside one organization is using the same thing. Put an Nginx in front or put Apache in front and then fight with how we invented the tags so you will be, to cr you will be able to create promotion between two registries, right? So, but it is what it is. This is exactly, this is, looks like a single, a single solution to do it. And there is something else. Registry mirror. Registry mirror sounds like another solution that might be helpful. What it does, registry mirror instructs Docker to ignore the host and the tag. It says, whatever host it is, instead go to my in-house registry whether there is a host in a tag or there is no host in a tag, which means Docker Hub by default, but again, you can instruct Docker to ignore and go to the local registry instead, which is nice, but it's still a single URL. It's it will be still a single host, which means that all the dance around those promotions and rewrite of the URLs still need to happen. And another limitation of register mirror is that it is set per Docker client. So if I have a new developer on my team that will install Docker and want to do this register mirror thing, it will use the tags, the hosts that are listed on the tags, or if there are no, no uh, tags, it will go, uh, no host, it will go to Docker Hub. So, um, not exactly, right? Not exactly. Okay. Um, there is something else. And the question is, why did you decide to promote a certain binary? So you have this Docker image in this repository and you need to decide now that this is the repository that you want to promote, this is the image that you want to promote to the next repository. Why? Based on what you decide to do that. How can you find a needle in a haystack of binaries that you have to know that that's the image that you need to promote? Questions like, I have multiple servers. What is deployed on those servers? Or questions like, I have some binary. I have now a, a Docker image. How the hell can I know how it was built? By whom and when? And why it has what it has? Or cherry picking one to go to the production through the promotion pipelines. And the solution is, of course, metadata. <laughs> and Docker, since um, relatively recent version, supports metadata on images, which is actually very cool. You can add now metadata to your images containers or daemons. Daemons is not exactly interesting. What we care about are images. Those are key values, but those are great because that's exactly where you describe that it works in 
Chrome and Firefox, but won't, won't, uh, won't work in Internet Explorer, right? So this is a good thing. The question is, what is not being taken care of yet by Docker is how do you consume this metadata? How can you find images based on this metadata and what you can say? The good news are if you use Artifactory as your Docker image, as your Docker repository, you can use Artifactory query language to consume this metadata in general. And you can find queries like, find me an image that has a certain key and a certain label and participated in a certain build and was downloaded more than three times and have size less than 600 megabytes. Any type of information, both added through metadata to images or born as a native metadata like the size or number of downloads can be queried by this language. So this is a very powerful um, completion to the ability to annotate the images with metadata. And the one thing that I want to um, end up with is that your mileage might vary. Um, your promotion pipelines can look completely different from what, how we envision it or even how I told you today. You might want to do additional steps when you promote those images or you might want to deploy to production, each, to deploy to environment each time you promote um, an, an image or, or whatever you like. So um, a truly powerful um, repository would give you the ability to script the promotion or at least hook into the promotion pipeline and do your own thing. So that's exactly what we do, right? You can do whatever you like and be as flexible as you like. That's just Googling for flexible image, right? It's nothing there. So this is how it looks like. And you have this callback. Uh, it will run on call for promotion. You will get build name, build number, the build and the number that originally built this image. And then you will be able to write uh, whatever you like um, and, and do any promotion that you like. So the whole idea of uh, having those tools is the ability to automate your promotion pipelines and build the same level of trust that I mentioned earlier that should help you take eventually, finally, take this great thing that is called Docker to production. The last slide is about having a vacation in Napa. Napa Valley in California, good wine, and Jeff user conference. We have CFP open, and that's a great way to get there without paying for participating in the conference, right? Being a speaker is your poor man way to go to conferences. It's true for Swamp Up as well, right? So CFP is open, and you're more than welcome to submit some talks. Thank you very much, and I have 15 minutes or 10 minutes or whatever minutes for questions. Thank you. Anything? I don't know, we have lunch now? No, no so there is no rush. You can ask questions. <laughs> now, uh, yes. Okay, that's the, the question is what the problem with what's the problem with tag, right? During the promotion, you can just re-tag your image, right? That's a great question. The, the, the answer is the problem is what information you have in the tag. The only thing you have in the tag is the host name. So if you have multiple repositories inside your organization, for example, you have artifactory on the local host, and then you have in artifactory slash staging slash pre-production slash production. There is no way you can tag an image with this information. Yeah, but if you have one uh, host name named Celeste or something, and not only 
Yeah, so that's, okay, so the question is, okay, then I need a host name for production and a host name for staging and a host name for pre-production. Great, that's very, that's exactly the solution. But what does it mean having multiple host names? Should I buy more than one domain for that? Or should I have my repositories split on different machines so they will have different host names? We have to do some tricks here. Yes, I, I can definitely install registries on different machines in my organization, right? I can have a, a production registry on one machine and a staging registry on another machine, but then the promotion will be dragging images between machines. Well, yes, yes, they can point to the same machine, and that's exactly what you do with tools like Nginx and Apache. You have what are called virtual host names, when they are essentially the same host name, but you invent names to convert between a full path of artifactory slash, um, promo slash production to a host name which is called artprod, and from artifactory slash staging to a virtual host name that is called art staging. Those are the dirty tricks that we have to do because the tag by itself can only contain a host name and not a full path, right? So that's, that's exactly the problem that need to be solved with a URL rewriting with virtual hosts. And it's actually, unfortunately, we felt very dirty when we did it for the first time because it looks like a hack, but then actually now this is how Docker suggests you to do that so we feel a little bit better with ourselves. <laughs> Why do you need to have different uh, uh, repos for, for, the, for Docker images? Well, that's a very good question. Thank you very much. And the question is, why the hell do I need multiple repositories for Docker images? I can have one repository, and by using different types of metadata, except for the location, something like the tags, I can annotate and select which images are on which stage of my promotion pipeline, right? I don't need to drag them around between repositories. I can say this image, key uh, status, value staging, and that's all. When I do a promotion, all I need to do is change the value of this metadata. And I have to say that um, I assume that when Docker envisioned how the promotion pipelines will be built inside this single registry that they force you to have, that was exactly the idea. So why it's not good enough? And it's not good enough because of trust. Quality gates, physical quality gates, are a very powerful concept that give you the trust that inside your staging or pre-production or production repository will only be found the, the images that are entitled to be there. Once you have this guarantee, it simplifies a lot. For example, you don't need Docker Notary anymore. Once you can be sure that the repository is set up correctly, the promotion pipeline is set up correctly, and the permissions on the repository set up correctly, you are, can be 100% sure that the images in this repository that you can access are the images that you are entitled to get. So quality gates by repositories are much stronger guarantee than quality gates by key value uh, metadata or any other kind of metadata. More questions? Oh, yeah. Do you run Docker introduction? Yes, we do. We thank you for this question. We are very afraid, not very trustworthy, but yes, we run Docker in production. Um, uh, well, yeah, this helps us, of course, but um, we still feel this kind of opaqueness when it comes to, are you sure that you know what's going on inside your image? We at least now know what image is it, but still, it's kind of scary, especially when you need to ask questions like, what's inside this image that runs into production? We probably will do something about it. 
so we will feel even better with ourselves. But yes, yeah. Yes, you can get Artifactory as a Docker image. The benefit will be it's already come with pre-configured Nginx that will solve the problem of having uh, the, the tag with hostname only. Yeah, that will be easier to set up. Yes. That's a great question. I think it's a little bit late during the talk <laughs> to ask it. So the question is, what is Docker image? <laughs> and Docker image is the binary that container is created from. It's a template that you create a container from. It's the, taking the analogy of virtual machine, it's like the virtual machine image that you run your virtual machine from. And it's the same for Docker container. Docker container is run from Docker image. It's the container before it actually runs, before it being a container. All right, thank you very much again.